Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Adam Dakin, Managing Director with DreamIt Ventures. Uh, I lead the health tech venture. I'm joined today by Jeff Starr, partner from Cooley. Uh, we're excited to talk to you about common mistakes uh, that founders make regarding equity and funding. Uh, we're still waiting for your friends and colleagues to arrive, so we'll kick off in, uh, in just a couple minutes here. Delighted to have you here, Jeff. I'm really excited about this conversation because this is a topic that I think uh, we see companies, startups make uh, sort of fatal mistakes early on, you know, they're just getting off the ground. Um, and they're sort of easy mistakes to avoid. I think, I think that's right. I mean, they're mistakes that uh, I spend a lot of time talking to people about and trying to, to fix uh, to the extent possible. But yeah, I think your, your point is, is the right one that these are uh, avoidable largely, right? With a little bit of thought and planning and, and focus on, on them throughout the, the process. Yeah, I mean, having good counsel advisors around the table who have the pattern recognition I think that you have, that your firm has, um, sort of makes it easy to navigate away from the rocks on these things? Yeah, no, I mean, l l part of what we do is we trail guide, right? And that's how we describe ourselves in, in, in part in that we, we are trying to help you avoid the, the, the common mistakes, right? The things that will become distractions when you get to a, a point where you've got an important transaction or, or a financing event or something happening, right, where you need things to be ship shape. Yeah, I think the problem we run into a lot, especially with less experienced founders, is some of these seem rather inconsequential at the time of the formation, but they snowball into much larger issues right. downstream. Right. That's part of what we're going to talk about. <laughs> that's a lot of what we're that, going to that, talk that, about. That, that's exactly so, right. Yeah. They, they do seem inconsequential at, at, at the time or at the start, but as the company evolves, develops, grows, the, the magnitude, or at least the, the opportunity, or the, frankly the cost to fix a lot of this just increases on an exponential curve. Yep, no, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, it seems like there's, you know, there's always, there's never time to do things right, but there's always time to do them over. That's right, and that's, that's right. And it's always more expensive to do them over when you need to get- That is uh, very true. Advisors. That is very uh, true. Expensive advisors. That is very true. Um, Involved. And frankly, investors, a buyer is going to make you do that uh, it, because right. they're not, not they're, 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 they're not going to they're not going to invest in or buy a problem, and and so you're going to have to do it at some point. And I think to your point, it's 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 frankly worth a little bit of time and effort early on to do it and to try to do it as right as you can to avoid the 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 pain and the distraction later on. Yep. Okay, we're getting ready to getting very close, ready to kick off here. All right, well, welcome everyone. We are ready to get started. Uh, I'm Adam Dakin, Managing Director for DreamIt's Health Tech Vertical. Most of you know DreamIt is a venture fund. We're located in Philadelphia where it's pretty miserable today. Just, just started snowing here. Uh, I am really delighted to be joined today by Jeff Starr, who's a, a partner at Cooley. Um, Jeff, I think it would be, uh, and by the way, uh, DreamIt, a number of DreamIt companies uh, have had the pleasure of working with Cooley. Uh, and I've also had the pleasure of working with Jeff on a couple of deals. Um, top rate, really provide excellent counsel, have, have done an amazing job in helping, helping navigate some pretty choppy waters uh, as of late. And you, <laughs> you know exactly who I'm talking about. Uh, but they shall, you know, to protect we'll the change, guilty. We'll change the names right. to protect the innocent, right? Exactly, to protect the guilty, we'll, we will not share that. But anyway, Jeff, thank you so much for doing yeah. this. I uh, really appreciate it. I'm really excited to have this conversation. Uh, might be helpful to start with a little bit on your background and a little bit on Cooley and then sure. we'll jump into it. Sure. So I'm a partner at Cooley in, in the corporate group. I work with high growth uh, companies that are uh, focused on developing some kind of technology, whether that's a life sciences, healthcare type technology or, or more of a software or other type of application. I also work with the investors that fund these companies and uh, have a, a, a full life cycle practice, which means I work with entrepreneurs and investors at the earliest stages uh, of these companies all the way through to, to an exit event, whether that's an M&A transaction or an IPO or, or some other kind of liquidity uh, transaction. Uh, Cooley as a firm, so we're about a thousand lawyers at this point, um, more than a dozen offices around the world, started over a hundred years ago, or just about a hundred years ago in San Francisco, uh, with, with offices now up and down the east and west coast of the United States, Hong Kong, Singapore, 
uh, Shanghai, Beijing, as well as uh, in, in, in London, uh, moving into Europe. And so we, we are uh, a firm that is dedicated and, and largely built on the, the emerging company. We understand the business and, and we are passionate about what we do, helping founders build great companies. Yeah, and you guys have a lot of resources. We'll touch on some of those. But I think, you know, Cooley as a firm has clearly made a commitment to the startup ecosystem, to providing a lot of resources, a lot of those at low or no cost to help entrepreneurs find their footing and get going. So today we're going we're gonna to cover five very common mistakes. Um, you've done hundreds of deals, so you have great pattern recognition around what a lot of these <laughs> common mistakes are. Um, so in no specific order, this is not a countdown, but we're just going to identify sort of five very common mistakes that fall into these different sort of these different buckets. So the first one, um, common mistake is poorly structured founder equity. So it's day one, we may not even created the company yet, yet there's a potential to screw this up. What are some of the most sort of, what is one of the, what are the common mistakes you see when the founders are whacking out that initial equity? So I think the most common mistake is, is to assume that there's really one way to do that, and, and maybe that's the equal allocation method or, uh, or some other pie splitting method. The reality is this is something that, that takes a lot of, not necessarily a lot of, but thought, thought and, and I think uh, intentionality around understanding relative contributions, who's doing what, uh, and, 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 and really trying to allocate equity according to that, right? So I think a lot of founders, they, 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 they come to this and they either want to avoid conversations or don't want to have conversations early on about, about relative contributions and what things are, how the things are going to play out. And so they may say, okay, there are four of us. We're each going to have 25% from the start and we're going to all join hands and go forward and this thing is going to be a success. I think there are others that, frankly, can, can way overthink this. Right, and end up in a circumstance in which no one's happy, which is never a good place to start either. So I always encourage people to have thoughtful, frank conversations about relative contributions, what people are bringing to the, to the, the venture, and how they, how they really anticipate this to, to evolve, recognizing that it's largely speculative at, at the start. Right? It's, it's, it is, uh, you're trying to solve for, for what is an unknown because this is such a dynamic experience. Yeah, it, we see a lot of companies that show up with the default of we just whacked it up evenly. And from an investor perspective, that's a bit of a red flag because we know it's very unlikely that, that they're, they're all contributing. Be, they're all contributing equally, right? Someone, typically there might be a technical founder who's bringing some of the IP, right? And they right. something they've been working on for a long time, right? So their contribution typically is more up to that point in time then maybe they're bringing in a business person now to be a co-founder, to help with commercialization, right. other things. And so whacking up. The other problem this creates, and we see this all the time with two co-founders, you know, the dreaded 50-50 split. Right. Which, <laughs> in addition to the problems we're talking about here, which is it's not the right way to do it, it also creates governance issues. Right, and, and, and the potential for deadlock, which, which is never a place where you, where you want to be. You know, that, that, now, all this said, right, there may be circumstances in which an, an equal allocation is appropriate. So it's, it's not saying that this is never the case, but I think as, as a default or as, as a way to avoid conversation, it's never a good place to start. And so as a consequence, if you are going to start in some of these circumstances, it's important to understand or at least make sure that you have tools and processes in place to, frankly, allow for the very high, high possibility that things are going to change. Right. And they're going to change in a number of ways. But, I mean, I personally have been involved. I made the mistake of a 50-50 split in one of the companies that I co-founded. And to this day, that co-founder and I still don't send each other Christmas cards. And it's a shame because <laughs> right. we started out with a very aligned vision, right. and then we diverged. Uh, and then ultimately, we had to get lawyers involved to figure this thing out. Yep. And if, if one of us has just had a half a percent more than the other, it may not have been friendly, but at least we wouldn't have had to get the lawyers involved. Or a mechanism to account for what happens if you, if right. you do find yourself in deadlock. And I've seen lots of creative ways to, to, to do that, not necessarily right for, for all companies, but I think thinking about that possibility up front is really important and in and, 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 and trying to get alignment on, on what that possibility could be 
is going to be a lot helpful because to your point, once there starts to be some, some, some dissension or some, some adversity that's introduced to the mix, people tend not to think as rationally. Yeah, people uh, just get emotional. <laughs> I mean, when you get in that situation, it becomes emotional and then that's right. clearer heads don't, don't prevail. That's right. And it gets very contentious very quickly. Um, but to your point, anticipating how things are going to change downstream. So even, let's say we are thoughtful and we're able to figure out what the appropriate allocation of equity is among this group of founders. But we, to the point you just made, we know things are going to change. And very few companies end up with the same founding team six months or a year down the road that they had on day one. How do we anticipate, what sorts of tools or mechanisms can we use to anticipate those kinds of changes. So the so right so so startups or emerging growth companies they're they're very dynamic right they're going to change the the cap table is going to change and so the founder dynamic is going to change and so one of the ways that you you account for that that likelihood is having appropriate controls and restrictions on on the equity that founders get from the outset the most common being vesting restrictions or forfeit uh, forfeiture restrictions um, that apply in the event people come and go and decide to do other things, right? And so what it does is it has this, this sort of natural effect of potentially right-sizing uh, alloc uh, equity allocations relative to contribution. If someone was going to leave, decide to become a beet farmer in Hawaii and no longer wants to be involved, you, you end up with sort of this free rider problem if, if, right. if that individual is going to keep all his or her equity. And so having either forfeiture or vesting type provisions associated with the, 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 the founder's equity that they get uh, at the outset seems to mitigate, has the potential to mitigate those kind of possibilities. Right, because when you don't have those vesting considerations and then you're having an unfriendly conversation later on about, hey, you know, you left after six months, Jeff. I right. just you, don't think you it's still fair have, that you have 50% of right. the company. When I'm staying here, I'm going to continue to take risk, work without a salary, make a lot of personal uh, and financial sacrifice to do this. It just seems inherently unfair that you would walk away with 50%. But the problem at that point is even if we can agree on that conceptually, so is it 30%? How much should right. you get? 25%? Or even if we're going to do a restart, right, uh, in, in recognizing that this, this is a company, there's maybe some, some legacy intellectual property that you want to leverage. and, and do something entirely different with a different team, how do you actually have to manage that? And it tends to be the case that you've got to put together a much more complicated transaction to restart it than if you had appropriate vesting or forfeiture provisions associated with the equity from the, from the start. And what are some of the common structures or schedules you've seen, right? So we're starting the company. Should, should some of that be sort of non forfeiture Forfeitable? Forf forfeitable. For, for, forfeitable. <laughs> forfeitable. Right. Like some of that, I started the company, I deserve to get some ownership maybe going forward, even if I quit tomorrow. Yep. But some of it should vest over time. How do we figure out what? So the couple that? ways to look at it, I think that, so the, 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 the question of uh, whether any should be non-forfeitable or not, not subject to forfeiture from the start, how much, I look at that from the perspective of, it, 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 what are what are how, so how far along is the enterprise or the the organization at the time you're making these decisions in the first instance, right? If this is not happening out the gate, uh, if it is happening out the gate, then you kind of think about well, is there something that someone's bringing to the to the to the business, right? Like intellectual property, contributing capital, something that would I, I think lead one to the conclusion that some should be non-forfeitable, right? But as a general matter, I think that founders going into this from the start, I, I don't see why you, you wouldn't necessarily have all of it subject to forfeiture, recognizing that things are going to change and going to change very, very quickly. And you can always incorporate acceleration type provisions to account for the possibility that someone is asked to leave or a transaction happens sooner than expected to so that you don't end up in a situation where you're losing equity even though you've created a lot of value in a very short period of time. Yeah, because I think what's going if you don't do that, right, then it's a good chance it'll be forced upon you because as investors, we certainly are not comfortable with the team having all their equity 
you know, already right. You want to make sure right? that there's some alignment and incentive to... We want to... the team to be heavily incentivized and to earn. So I think generally investors are okay with saying, hey, you've worked hard to get the company to this point. Mm -hmm. There is some equity that you deserve for that, but probably not all the equity because now what's your motivation? What's your incentive to keep creating more value? Right. So then we'll be negotiating on, well, you know what? Maybe it's okay if you keep a third of your shares, but the other two third needs to vest. We really want you to stay, but that guy not so much, you know? Right. So it, I think it's easier if you set it up as a company up front, make sort of know what market is. What the expectation is and anticipate that and you're probably gonna end up in a, you know, from your perspective, a better position than you might otherwise, right? Right, if you're <laughs> negotiating from from a blank piece of paper and then you know the investors start right. high, you go low, and as opposed to starting right. from something that's acceptable. And to, to an earlier point, you may find yourself in, uh, in the midst of financing transaction and you've got founders that didn't have vesting associated with their equity that aren't particularly involved anymore and to go back and try to have those conversations with people, it can be very, very difficult. Yep, and I just want to remind everyone, please post your questions. We are gonna, Jeff and I are gonna talk for maybe another 20, 25 minutes or so, and then we will answer your questions. So, you know, so please post them uh, in the box down below. Okay, so that was number one. That was poorly structured founders equity. <laughs> I think we covered most of the, of the key points there. So we will move on to number two, which is the segue from if you don't do what we just talked about, one of my, uh, one of my personal pet peeves, because we see it all the time, founders drama. We see founders drama all the time. And this, this is what happens when you don't set out expectations in writing uh, and you don't, you know, you don't appropriate doc, appropriately document those, those discussions. Right. right? I think that the, the drama is, is, is really a consequence of not having those conversations and being at least attempting to be thoughtful about how, you, how you're actually going into a venture together. Right, you end up in a circumstance where either equity is misaligned, at least there's a sense that that's the case, or potential for deadlock, or any, any number of things could, could create it. Yeah, and so as, as an investor coming in, we will obviously pick up on that dissension pretty quickly when employees are unhappy with their equity allocations, or a co-founder, worst case, and this has happened multiple times, then a co-founder starts to threaten the company because they, they know they're on the way out uh, and they feel like, oh, well, I want this amount of equity. Or we had a company where the founder said, well, fine, I'll go, but you owe me back salary. Right. Right. And then they make the mistake of actually documenting this stuff, memorializing it, sending it to the company, and now this is disclosable, right, to a future investor. Right, and, and, and at the end of the day, it, it's 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 a distraction that's that you don't want, right? When, if, whether you're in, in, it's in connection with a financing transaction or some other important uh, transaction the company's going through, you want to be focused on the business and 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 the task at hand, not dealing with with founder dissension and disagreement and all of the things that, frankly, detract and and ultimately can result in in a company that just dies. As a, just due to <laughs> right, I mean, at the end of the day, it's you know, it's a bit cliche to say investors are investing in the team, right? It's always about the team. We bet on the jockey, not the horse. All those sort of uh, expressions. But the reality is, if there's founder dissension, then chances are you're not focusing on the stuff That's right. that creates value. You are distracted, and we as investors just don't have the bandwidth to diligence this to figure out right. like. You're right, no, you're right, no, this is fair, no, that's fair. I always say those kinds of things, those diligence items are the expressway to the life's too short bucket. That, that's right. right, and inevitably you probably say it's interesting, it's an interesting technology and opportunity, but figure it out and we'll, we'll come back right. to you. Come back and, later. And, and maybe we'll have the bandwidth at that point. I've seen, I, I, you see investors do that all the time. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot of founders don't realize that they have literally rendered the company non-financeable when they start getting into a contentious conversation with the company. Yep, um, it's, uh, it's the unfortunate <laughs> truth that, that that is the case. You know, it's, it's mutual assured destruction, right? Once right. you do that, the company is not so, yeah, you, fine, you can have your 30% of nothing, right? Right. Um, but 
probably wiser and smarter to have a smaller percent of something that gets financed and continues to right. to create value. And that's right? uh, unfortunately that that even that conversation at at, at the point of of uh, where things are contentious is, is frankly difficult to have because again it, it becomes very emotional, understandably, and people are less rational about how they think about this, and it's all the more reason why it's important at the outset to have some of these more thoughtful, intentional conversations about how this could evolve, right? And I think people go into those those circumstances like that, and and I think at the end of the day, everyone's much better off, and things things tend to work out. Yeah, I mean, I think to the point you raised when we were talking earlier, it seems like the financing events become the forcing function for these conversations. Very much so. And that's so. the worst time <laughs> to have these conversations. That's right, that's right. No, it, it absolutely is, it, for any number of reasons. Right, you want to be talking to your investors about the business and the business opportunity, not who you granted equity to uh, or promised equity to, or why it is that your, your former friend who's no longer involved still has 30% of the business. It's, it's not optimal to say the least. <laughs> right, and it also just makes you look unsophisticated as a team, right? Like, well, is there a problem that the foreign founder has 30% of the company? Right. And what I think also less experienced founders don't realize is it's not just that they have equity they don't deserve. It's the fact that you need that equity for other employees. That's right. Right? Like, how do I create and incentivize future employees? I'm going to end up taking most of that dilution, right? When right. I go to create an option pool, which is typically 10, 15% of a company's equity. Right. And somebody who's not involved and didn't contribute that much walked away with 30% this is a problem. No, I, 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 absolutely. And, and that's, it is, I mean, cap table is a bit of a zero sum, right? I mean, it's got a total 100 at the end of the day. And so it's a matter of where, where it's going to come from. And from an investor's perspective, it's not coming from them. And so it's, it's a matter of, of trying to anticipate all of this and make sure you've got the right controls in place at the outset. Okay. So that was our number two problem. That was founder's drama. And we will move on to number three, which you gave me the perfect segue for. Uh, <laughs> one of my personal favorites is the fucked up cap table. How often do we see cap tables that are screwed up? What are the common mistakes you see um, with startups? So uh, more often than not, when, when uh, working with companies that didn't, uh, didn't work with from the outset, there, there are cap table issues. And those issues range from, frankly, just wrong numbers on the cap table, not you know, maybe taking a step back, not having a cap table that they, they manage on a regular basis, uh, having a cap table that doesn't actually reflect the, the ownership, whether that's from a founder or employee or, or other perspective. So whether you've promised things that aren't reflected on the cap table, uh, it, 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 any number of different things you can imagine uh, we've seen. And so why? You know, I, a lot of companies, they don't address the, the, the funding becomes the forcing function to clean up the cap table. And to just expound a little bit on your point, what we see is, oh, well, we promised, you know, Joe, uh, he's an advisor. Right. He's been really helpful. So we promised him he'd get, you know, 1% equity. Right. It seems fair. I mean, Joe really helped us out and everyone agrees Joe should get some equity. What's why is that a problem? Yeah, the, 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 yes, so it's a problem on any number of levels. Uh, the first thing that one might think about is 1% relative to what, right? At what point? Uh, and, and to your earlier point, if, if, the, if the transaction becomes the forcing function and you're now dealing with a, 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 a former promise to grant 1%, then you may find yourself in a circumstance in which you're inevitably giving up more than you otherwise would and never a great place to be. But there are also other tax and economic consequences of not documenting these things properly or appropriately at the outset and doing it later when the company has had some kind of value uh, accretion in the interim. Uh, you find yourself in a circumstance in which you're now obligated to grant someone something that's quite valuable that's going to be taxable to them, right? And they may have had an expectation that it wouldn't have been or that they were getting a particular kind, whether it's restricted stock versus options. All sorts of different things arise, come into play when you, when you don't document things properly from the start. 
And I think a lot of founders don't appreciate that it's the complexity and the terms of the grant are really important, right? It's not just the 1%, which you've appropriately pointed out is 1% of what? Like, oh, is it 50,000 shares? Like, and, and, but there are terms, like we talked about before. What is the actual vesting going to be? Right. What is, if it's options, are they options or are they restricted shares, right? right? Those are different. Um, they have different tax consequences. They, you need to create an option plan if you're going to do options. Right. Right. Or you need to you need to memorialize what the terms of those restricted shares are. Restricted shares, for folks who don't know, are shares that the company has the right to buy back, um, and they vest, and the company loses that right to buy back those shares over time. So they're kind of like options, but they have different tax consequences, and in some way are more favorable or can be more favorable. Yeah, I mean, right. Restricted stocks just common stock that has some kind of restriction associated with it, and it's, it's whether it's vesting or, or forfeiture or buyback or some some kind of restriction. As I said, it, uh, it, it yeah, it, they can be much more tax effective at the end of the day. But you, either whether they're options or restricted stock, the terms have to be memorialized. What is the vesting schedule in the case of options? What's the strike price? Right, right? like all that has to be in writing because here's what. What I've had happen is you go back to somebody six, hey, Jeff, I promise you, you know, you're getting that 1%. Don't worry, but, you know, right. no point in doing it right now. Why spend all the money to send up a stock option plan? We haven't even raised capital yet. Right. Awesome. <laughs> six months from now, Jeff, great news. We got, we got a term sheet. Right. You're, get, you're gonna get 1%. And um, like we talked about, uh, that's going to vest over four years. There'll be a one-year cliff, meaning you don't get any of it unless right. you stay on board right. for a year. Uh, and all of a sudden, I have this sense that your memory might be different right. than what I think the terms or what the terms the investors are saying. This is the stock option agreement. These are the terms. Right. Here's the vesting. Here's the strike price. And that might not align with your expectations or even the conversation we, we both remember we had six months ago but the investors are, are changing the rules. Right, and that's why it's important, obviously, to just to, to do it right the first time. And in and, and this day and age, there's really no reason why, why, uh, why a company can't. There are any number of resources that are out there that are available to do these things in a very cost-effective manner. And, and frankly, at the end of the day, they're, they're, they're not that difficult to, to do and to do properly uh, at the outset. And to your, one of the points you made earlier, it's, it's a heck of a lot more expensive to fix it than it is to do it right the first time. Yeah, I think the other reason this is so concerning, because usually that's, a, it is, as long as you're dealing with reasonable people, it's generally a fixable problem. It, it can be a little bit painful to right. do Sometimes it. Right, sometimes it's a matter of how much it costs, but it can right. be fixed. It, but it <laughs> happens, unfortunately, so routinely that, you know, investors, I don't think we have the luxury of always walking away, or we don't want to if we're excited about a company and it's right. a fixable problem. But I think it, it is a red flag that raises concern about what else hasn't been properly managed, right? If you're not managing your cap table, which is relatively easy. And fundamental in that it really goes to ownership and economic interest, right? I mean, that you would think that would be top of mind to, to most people is understanding what they own and, and how much of it. So it, it suggests that, you know, if you're not disciplined and diligent in maintaining your cap table, all of a sudden I'm worried that you're not diligent in maintaining up your, are your financial statements current? Right. Are you keeping your, corporate governance documents. Right, do you have IP assignments from all of, your, assignments. all of your employees and contractors, right? And absolutely. So all of a sudden, you know, my, you know, <laughs> you know my concern ratchets up a notch right. that there may be all these other gremlins in the bushes that, that I need to go diligence, you know, even more. And fundamentally, as we discussed, it really just becomes a distraction. And, and it's, it's when, you, when you're, in the circumstance in which you really want to be talking about the business and the business opportunity and impressing investors or partners or whoever you're, you're transacting with to be dealing with this, it, it's frustrating, it's, it's not what you want to be doing. Right, I mean the flip side is when we're diligencing a company and they've got everything, they've got the cap table organized, the financial statements are up to date, right? That gives the investor a really good vibe, like yeah, this is a team I want to bet on. You know, they dot their I's, That's they right. cross their T's, you know, they, you know, if there's something a little wacky on the financial statements, they have an explanation for it. Right. Right? 
and, and fundamentally, what I tell what I tell the the companies that I work with is this: ultimately, is going to go to value at the end of the day, and that you go to sell a clean house, people are going to pay for that, right? You try to go to sell a house and the roof is leaking, and maybe the foundation is cracked, and the windows are maybe broken. People are going to look at that and they're start they're start going to ding you along the way. Right, right. It's, it's ultimately going to be dollars in your pocket. Absolutely. So, what are some of the sort of what 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 are the good practices that are and tools companies can use to sort of stay on top of keeping the cap table current and up to date? Yeah. So, so uh, I think this day and age, it's safe to say that there's there's really no reason why companies shouldn't have uh, a, a cap table that's that's complete, accurate. Uh, there are any number of cap table management platforms that are, that are out there. I think Carta is the most widely known and, and perhaps used. Uh, they've got a lot of different tiered offerings for various stages of, of development. Uh, you know, frankly, you can do that. You can, you can manage this through Excel. I mean, we've got a website that we curate, Cooley Go, that has a form of cap table that you can manage through Excel. It's, it's not complicated work to do, but it I think is helpful in that it, as we talked about forcing functions previously, it, it really does force you to make sure that what's reflected on the cap table ties out to some something, right? And going through that exercise and doing it regularly, I think is really helpful because when you do then get to the, the, the point where you're going through financing a transaction or something else, you've got a nice trail that you can point to when people have questions about who owns what. Yeah, and there are a lot of great resources, free resources and templates on the Cooligo yeah. website. I was, I was checking it out, and it, it really is a good resource if, if you haven't checked it out. Um, but to your point, the other piece where this falls down is what the electronic cap table does is it forces you to close the loop. So you have to have a signed stock option agreement. That's right. right. It's not just we agree, right. you're you, good, you, you need but to the have... software will force you to then issue and execute the, the agreement before agreement. it then moves on to right. your cap table. That's right. 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 And then it automatically keeps track of things like, hey, this is what my option pool looks like. Right? So right. and makes it very easy for an investor to go in and say, oh, I want to know exactly what the vesting schedule is, what percent of the pool has been granted. Right. Right? If I if you can do that instantly, you get a lot of credibility as opposed to let me get back to you. <laughs> we'll come back to you in a couple of weeks when we got it all cleaned up and, and, and looking good, right? Um, okay, so that was that was the fucked up cap table. That was that was number three on uh, on our list. We're done with that one. Moving on. Okay, so moving on to number four. Um, poorly structured seed funding. So before we get into the specifics and some of the common mistakes we've seen, typically when companies are doing their seed round, there's really, there's equity or debt, right? Those are pretty much your, your two options. So the two options are effectively a price round or debt in the form of a safe note or a convertible note. Can you talk a little bit about when either of those is preferred and why? So it, it uh... It largely depends, I think, so I think just backing up, so I think it's safe to say that uh, today it's still the case that the most common instrument to fund a seed financing is, is a convertible note or safe. I think we talked about, a little bit about before this, uh, there tends to be you know, maybe a little coastal uh, tension in that uh, in the past we've seen a little bit more activity among the safes in the West Coast than we did in the East Coast. I think notes generally are making a bit of a comeback across the the, the country generally. Um, you know, that said, when, when you've got institutional investors that are willing to get involved early on, I, I've seen uh, an uptick in the number that are socializing priced rounds. And you know, frankly, that's not the worst situation to be in, is to get a partner like that early on, assuming you can, you can come to a, a consensus on evaluation, right? But as a general matter, I think it's, it, it, it's safe to say that most seed financings are going to be either convertible notes or, or safe agreement type, type transactions. And that said, there are, and maybe you can provide some insight here, I'm not sure I totally understand why there are certain, particularly angel groups, who just will not invest in anything, but it's just 
It's not even up for discussion. <laughs> it's a price round or you can leave now. Yeah, and I think part of that is the a, a view that a, either a note or a safe is, is sort of the bridge to who knows where, right? And I think some angel groups and those that may not be, you know, I don't want to say as sophisticated, but they're looking for a, a kind of economic return. And from their perspective, equity from the start at a low valuation is, is what they view as being mo a, a optimal from that perspective. And so I, I tend to see angel groups that want to do equity from the start also negotiating more onerous terms than those that are more inclined to do notes or, or even a safe agreement. I, you know, for the most part, I don't see a lot of angels doing, at least angel groups, doing safe uh, uh, financings. They tend, to, they tend to do note financings. At least that's my experience. But yeah, I, it, there certainly are those angel groups that all they want to do is, is uh, price round, and usually that value is, is, is low, and usually those terms are onerous. Right. I mean, I think their motivation is to get a bargain or just to get yeah. in at what they think. And they're not, I mean, and, 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 and understandably, valuation. in the sense that they're, they're not professional investors like, like you are, like other institutions are uh, that do this all the time, and they're looking for a, a, a return, right? Yeah, and I also think um, or, I hear I say a particular return. Yep, and what we hear a lot from entrepreneurs is like, well, oh, that angel group, you know, they they put forth this term sheet at this ridiculously low valuation, and I always say, it's if do you believe in supply and demand? <laughs> right, right. Then, Sometimes that's the only money that's there, right? And you, you right. got it. If you could get a better deal, go get it. Right, right. You can't call this a bad deal. It, it drives me crazy because I hear entrepreneurs like. Oh, the venture guys are really trying to screw us on this deal. I'm like, well, go get a better deal. You don't have to take our money. You don't have to take that angel group's money. Right. Right. If that's the only deal you've got and you need the money, by definition, it's the best deal you've got, right? It's I a fair <laughs> deal, right? So I think that gets sometimes that that gets lost. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you, you, you I mean, you, 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 as you say, it's the supply and demand, and sometimes the opportunities are limited, and sometimes that's just a matter of, of the cycles that we're in, or where you, where you're, where you're hitting the market, right, and where venture invest, investors and other investors are in their life cycles, and so a number of things play into it, and it's not necessarily all rational. So I think that's that's a very good overview of kind of notes versus price equity. Um, how about on the amount being raised? Do companies generally, you know, do you see mistakes in their ask? So m m mistake in the sense that, and this is something that I, I, uh, I talk to companies a lot about is when, we talk, when, they, when they come and they say, we're going we're gonna to raise some money, we're going to do seed financing, we're going to raise a million dollars. And inevitably my question is, for what? Where is that going to get you? Is that the right amount? It's a nice round number, right? It's, it's got lots of digits to it, and it sounds good. Maybe it, it, it's sort of validating in some respect. But it's really important to be able to tie out that, that number, what you're asking for, to a plan. It doesn't have to be a perfect plan, but at least needs to be a defensible plan uh, from a budgeting and where this is actually going to get you. Because presumably you're raising one round, you're going to need to raise another round. I mean, there may be companies that are going to be quick and revenue generating off the start. And so maybe you only need to raise a single round, but inevitably you're raising a seed round that's going to lead to some point where you're going to need to raise more money. Uh, but understanding really what the plan is behind that, that ask is, I think, critical because it's really the first question that an investor is going to ask. You want a million dollars? For what? Right. And so it has to be tied to very clear, defendable, um, value creating milestones. That's right. And those value creating milestones are going to do one of two things. They're going to put you in a position to raise more capital at a better valuation or exit the business. Right? right. Those are the two sort of inflection points as investors we need to be convinced of, which means you have to then have a detailed budget behind that, which is here's the hiring plan, right? These right. are the salaries we're going to pay people. This is the team that we need. There's a lot of thought that goes in. And right. thought around, are these the milestones that right. you Are they the right milestones? Are right. they the right milestones, right? And have you vetted those if you're thinking it's acquisition time at that point, maybe? Well, have you talked to potential acquirers? Right. They agree that those are, in fact, the milestones that would get them right. excited. excited about. Right. Or if you're thinking this is our seed and this is what Series A investors, is that in, does that, in fact, align with what Series A? We see very commonly in the digital health space the bar keeps moving, but if you don't have one to two million dollars of ARR, 
there's a really good chance you're going to have a tough time getting a conversation That's right. with an institutional investor. That's right. Right? So if you show up with a plan that says, we're going to get to 500K MRR on your million dollars, <laughs> we got a problem. Because right. you're going to run out of money right. before you hit the million. Right. And that's the worst case scenario for an angel investor, right? right. The biggest fear of We've those seed investors. Funded you to nowhere, that, to no man's land. You know, the bridge to nowhere, funding to nowhere, the, the, you know, the punitive you know, financing when you've run right. out of money and your early investors are just going to get crushed. You know, or or get wiped out, um, and we have we actually have an expression. We say it all the time because companies do pitch us and they do that. Oh, we're raising a million dollars, which will get us eighteen months of runway, right? Right. Time is not a fundable milestone. Right. Right. That's the expression we we use around here a lot. Tell us what those milestones are. Put some cushion in there because it always costs more. <laughs> it it always, takes longer. Right. It always costs more and always takes longer and. You know, I have an experienced venture guy, friend of mine, who always used to say, multiply all timeline and cash flow projections by pi. Yeah, <laughs> that's probably a good. And I've looked back at companies. It's not that far off. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's just, it always no, I can, does I can see longer. that. No, that's always a conversation. And, and sometimes, I, I mean, I, I see this more and more where companies are, they want to raise the money. They don't want to part with the equity, right? And so they're, they tend to think they can do this on a shoestring budget. And for a lot of these, and particularly digital health companies, or at least those that are selling into healthcare where you've got the long sales cycle or you need to really build up a, a team, you're absolutely right. This takes significant capital. It takes time, resources to do it properly. Yeah, I mean, especially you know, in the med tech universe, sometimes the sales cycles can be a little shorter. Right. But in the digital health world, it's a system-wide sale. There are so many stakeholders that get involved in that sale that you better suit up for a 12 to 24 month sales cycle. Yeah. And your plan better reflect your pipeline, your projections. It's, oh, we had a great conversation, you know, with Penn Medicine, they seem excited. <laughs> oh, and you think you're gonna sign a contract with them in six months. Right. That would be a land speed world record. Yeah. You might be the first, Right. but I'm not gonna make a bet. I'm not gonna make an investment based on that, that possibility. On, like, and if that's what, and, and that, I'm going to assume the rest of your pipeline, I'm going to have to discount your whole pipeline because, you know, you've made these sort of right. optimistic right. assumptions. Yep. Um, so, yeah, and then the other mistake I think companies make along the amount they're raising is, I think more common than not, companies say, we're raising a range. We're raising three to five million. Right, and I think that feeds back to not really having a good sense of, of why you're raising it, right? Is uh, That's always, to me, a, a flag that comes up when someone says we're going to raise a range. It really fundamentally shows me that they don't have a good sense of, of what they're actually trying to get to, to be able to yeah, I think hit, that is hit a, a particular I milestone agree or inflection, more. inflection point. It's a super point. common mistake. Yeah. More com companies than not come in and say, we're raising a range, which the way I typically interpret that is... Well, we're raising yeah, much five, we can get. <laughs> but if we can't get five, we'll take three. Right. And that's, 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 that's a tough sell, right? So I think that's where your point is, have, have a plan, have a number. And, and I think that people see that, they respect that, and they're more inclined to help you hit it. Right. And I think investors will press you, and some might want to invest more, some might want to invest less. It's, and so that's a very, it's a very reasonable conversation to say, well, you're raising five, you have a plan. We'd be interested in investing three. Right. What does that plan look like? Right. That's a fair conversation. Totally fair. What would the milestones associated with a $3 million raise be? Would it make sense to raise $3 million? Right. I right. think that's perfectly no, fine. No, absolutely. And but not walking in going, well, we're raising three to five. If we can't get the five, <laughs> yep, for giving us three? Right. Uh, which I think. We'll, right. <laughs> we'll get 60% of the way there. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, Okay, so that was our number four. That was sort of under the, the mistake or category we're describing as poorly structured, uh, poorly supported and poorly structured seed funding. Oh, I did want to touch on one more topic related to that before we move on here uh, to the fifth and final. Um, another mistake that I think you described to me when we were talking ahead of time is the complexity of having a bunch of different notes um, so a lot of, look, you're trying to keep the lights on, you're raising as you go, you know, you got initial money, you know, Uncle Joe and Aunt Mary put 
some money in there on the cap table under one set of terms, but now we're incrementally raising 100 here, 200 here. Yep. What are some of the issues the company's facing? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it ultimately just makes it more difficult, more complicated when you then get to a triggering event that's going to convert all of this because you're going to have different notes converting at different rates. And you also can, investors are going to look at that potentially and say, let's just try to simplify this, which is going to require you to go back to have some conversations with people. I think there's, there's a lot of value in, in, and while easier said than done and totally recognize having a plan and having a, a fundraise go according to plan is, is one thing. Um, I think it is important to, to be thoughtful from the start how you're actually positioning yourself in terms of terms, what you're actually purporting to, to sell and, and raise on so that there really is a possibility that you're going to be able to complete a round of financing. And so one of the things often we'll see is someone thinking that Uncle Joe's investment is going to set the market for what they're offering. And the reality is that's not always the case. And particularly when you then run into an angel network that's interested, they may have a, diff a very different way of thinking about the investment opportunity than a family member that really just wants to support you, right? And so having a good sense of what the market is and, and being, I'd say, realistic about what, what you can invest. And again, it all goes back to supply and demand. If you've got the, the next hottest thing, then by all means, go for it. But most companies will not appear that way from the start and, and you know, frankly it's going to be a bit of a process to, to raise that money and so having a, I think a realistic expectation and, and, and something that ultimately is going to get you to a point where you've got a unified plan I think it's, it's a lot cleaner it reduces complexity once you hit that triggering event that whether it's an equity financing or something and I think part of the solution is just trying to use one instrument right and be That's consistent right. rather than have layer on layer on layer notes and safes and other. <laughs> right. Um, and sometimes that's difficult, right? Because we see companies that will, will bounce around, whether they'll go through different accelerator programs, all of which have different kind of equity uh, type instruments that they use. Um, so it, it can be difficult, but it's not to say that it's yeah, optimal. Yep. Okay. That was our number four. And we will move to the last but not least, which is kind of a catch-all. And then I want to move right to the questions because I see we've gotten a lot of great questions already. Um, but the catch-all is just sort of generally too many diligence items, right? There's no one catastrophic flaw, <laughs> but hey, I'm getting ready for a financing or my formation and there are a bunch of, you know, items that come up right. why is why is that a problem and, and how do we fix that so it, it, it ultimately goes to value in your, your earlier point if if there are, there are things that are wrong in one instance it, it really causes someone to think that there may be things wrong wrong in, in another area as well right and so you, you just at, at the end of the day don't want that distraction when you're either uh, trying to execute on a financing or, or a strategic partnership or something else, right? It's, it's really important at that point to be able to try to capture as much value as you can. And having a, a, a house that that's, looks orderly is, is going to be much more valuable to a potential investor or partner than, than one that's, that's not, where they're going to look at that. And if someone's going to pay for the risk associated with something not being you know, properly documented or, or whatever, right. and it's not going to be the investor or the partner, right? Yeah, it's, so it can, it's going to be right, the so it's can, going to be the owners. And the other, what what can ultimately happen is it's just the straw that breaks the camel's back, right? As investors, you're 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 soliciting an investor who's looking at hundreds of deals, and as more and more things stack up in your deal that require right. more and more work. And it's particularly, I think, important in, in, in with companies that are involved in healthcare, right? Regulated industry, whether it's med device or you're selling software into a, a health plan or a payer or whatever. Uh, that's obvi often it, it, it is the case that there's a lot of diligence that goes around the technology and understanding how the regulatory schemes apply to that. When you start to introduce what really are fundamental, very simple, you know, simple things to deal with. They just become a complete distraction to 
the opportunity at, at, at hand. Yep, it's a great point. And investors, you know, they have short attention spans. Yeah. So they'll move on pretty quickly as soon as they get any level of frustration with right. their particular I mean, healthcare deal. regulatory and, and uh, whether it's tough med tech, it's, it is tough enough, right? And understanding what that regime looks like and understanding the, 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 the risks associated with that, that's one thing. <laughs> but, but having all the rest of it is, is quite another. Okay. All right. Well, that was our fifth. Try that again. <laughs> All right. That was number five. So now let's move on um, to questions from our audience. And uh, first one, Charles wants to know, are there disadvantages, advantages or disadvantages to starting out as an LLC or a C-Corp? So uh, this is probably, uh, I think, frankly, a question you could spend uh, several hours on. I feel like I, we I, could I, spend several hours on all the questions. Yeah, I, I think this today. one in particular uh, lends itself to a, to a longer conversation. I think it's, it's safe to say that the dynamic has definitely shifted over the past several years with the introduction of, of some tax-advantaged uh, provisions in the, in the IRS code, and I'm thinking specifically around 1202 and what we commonly referred to as qualified small business stock. Uh, it is inevitably the case that most venture funds continue to be structured in a way that they need to invest in, in corporations. Uh, some are more willing to, I think, manage structures that allow them to invest in LLCs if that, if that, is, the, that is the case. But uh, you know, the short answer is, I, I, you know, what we tell people is, unless there's a real reason why an LLC is, is, is um, is is the clear choice you're, you're much better off from a just a cost and a where you're going to be ultimately uh starting out as a c-corp yep because i mean professional investors will force you you're going to get there you're going to get there eventually and, and frankly the cost to set both of them up from the start is it's not that different it used to be the case i think you could you, you, people had the sense that starting an llc or forming an llc really simple it's, it is a single page document but there are now so many resources to help with a corporate formation, I mean, we've got on Cooley Go whole suite of documents to help people form a company. Right, everything from your organizational documents to your initial founder equity issuances, so on and so forth. And so, the the, the cost associated with setting up a, a a corporation these days, I think, is significantly decreased. And as a consequence, I I, I tell people that unless there's a real reason why we should be in an LLC, and I, I I'm, I'm someone, frankly, who, who appreciates the, sort of the tax effectiveness of the LLC at the end of the day, it, it's not necessarily the right form for a lot of companies that are going to be raising financing. Yep, agreed. Um, all right, we have a question from Richard Hewen, CEO of a medical device company, and he said, I would like to hear your thoughts on equal splits, say four times 25%, with a formula to true up based on effort, typically hours uh, or days, at the end of a year or after three years? So I think, I, I, I think that's, it sounds like a thoughtful approach, right? I mean, I think the, the devil would be in the details, obviously, and understanding what that formula, that true-up formula look, looks like. Um, and, and just to go back, I, it, our, our discussion around equal allocation wasn't meant to say that that's, that's never the right approach, because I can think of any number of companies that I that I work with or have worked with where there was an equal out allocation out, out of the gate, but they did have mechanisms in place that recognized that some would be contributing more along the way, or at least there was that possibility. And so they either they, they set aside an, an equity incentive pool to, to, to account for that possibility. But I, I, I like the idea of, of constantly revisiting and making sure that the equity allocation actually reflects reality. And I think that but that doing it, almost, and I'd say in real time, but on a regular basis, looking at that, and it doesn't need to be sort of overthought, but it allows you to get in front of what could be a problem down the road, right? If you see that there's a founder that starts to drift, I think it's important to have that conversation early on, not when you're six months later and exactly. he or she is checked out and it's a lot more difficult to say, hey, you haven't done anything for six months. 100%. So I think you're, set that, if you want, if you're going to do that, set that expectation at the very beginning. Like, right. hey, you know what, every six months, We're gonna our team this. is going to sit down together 
So it's not triggered, it, the perception is it's not triggered by your lack of performance that's that right. we have to sit down that's and right. do this. No, that's our, that's our operating procedure. Every six months we sit down as a team and we have a very open, honest discussion about you and I think that builds trust. I think that 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 builds alignment. But I, I really do like the idea of having regular intervals and in where you're checking in and you're looking at this and look to the extent you you come up with a model that that you think anticipates the possibility and 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 could realign based on a formula. I, I think that's certainly something that I would I would be interested in seeing. Um, okay, Dan Rizzuto, who's the founder of Nia Therapeutics. Hey, Dan. Uh, Proud Philly-based, <laughs> awesome Philly-based startup. Um, wants to know, for seed round fundraising, when should the founder agree to a valuation cap? So I think to the, the one of the points you made earlier, when, when, when he, she has to, <laughs> is, is, is one answer. I think part of it is, the market is such these days that there is an expectation that most convertible instruments are going to have some kind of cap. I think it's important for founders to understand what the cap ultimately is, which is another way to get at a discount, right? And so one of the things that I talk to your founders and investors as they're, as they're thinking about these things is, is there a way to, to solve for this and try to deal with it maybe in one dynamic? Maybe just having a discount that may be slightly higher, right, but doesn't involve a cap. Because at the end of the day, again, you're, you want to make sure interests are aligned and and, and 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 it very well may be the case that that a cap is just something that as I said is expected these days but I think it's it's important for founders to understand and I know Dan knows this is it, it the effect that it has or could have in connection with you know, future financing rounds right you know one of the things to you know that you mentioned earlier I think is is if you are going to have a cap making sure it it bears some some sense to reality, right? Uh, in that it it does also have a, a potential to set expectation, whether that's for investors or your future right. investors. And so, you know, not to say that there's ever a right answer around what that is, but you know, just like everything that we're, we we do and we've, we've talked about, it's important to educate yourself, I think, and have a good sense of hey, what the mar what's the market is, what's the expectation, and then what do we think we we should be proposing that we can defend. Yep. I think what's sort of implied in Dan's question is that you don't always have a lead investor who's going to set that cap for you, right? That, it's an easy conversation. If I have a lead investor, setting a cap is we're really just negotiating over valuation. Because effectively, from most investor perspective, a cap is your valuation, right? That's how we kind of look at it. At the end of the day, it is a cap and your valuation might come in lower, but for planning purposes, we're going to assume that your cap is your valuation. But I think what some founders do, the mistake they make, is they go out and they raise from friends and family without a cap. And then as soon as you show up in front of a sophisticated or a professional investor, that's a non-starter. Like, we're generally not going to invest in an early round that doesn't have a cap. I mean, look at it from the investor's perspective. What, how are we getting rewarded for the early risk we're taking? We're gonna give you money, we're gonna invest in you, you're hopefully going to hit at several key value creating milestones on that money. Your valuation is going to go up and now I get rewarded by getting equity at the higher valuation that you use my capital to de-risk and to get those, but now I'm not participating in the upside. So we think just philosophically to most in professional investors, a note without a cap is a non-starter. So you may look at it as a founder, like, oh, yeah, well, you know, I'm willing to negotiate that. Well, that's fine if you have a sophisticated investor on the other side of the table right. who knows what market is, who can put a rationale behind that cap. But a lot of times you're in a trickier spot where you're doing a seed round with friends and family, and you, you sort of have to set that cap yourself, right? Right. I, th I, th I think that's right. I mean, I think it goes to market expectation. Uh, uh, again, I mean, I think... I, I view I view this uh, I view a cap as uh, again it's it, it is a way to get at the discount again right I mean because that's fundamentally what what it what it has the potential of of doing but I think the, the point is 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 a valid one that the, the market is such that there's an expectation there's going to be a cap and it's just a matter of of what that is yeah and I mean you can talk to guys like you 
other angel groups, investors to get a sense. There are typically market ranges for these things, right? You're typically not a snowflake, right? You're a pre-revenue digital health company with a SaaS platform, right? Or maybe you're, you're that category, but you have early revenue from three customers. There's just sort of a valuation range for those companies that people sort of expect to hear. And if you fall significantly above that range, people are going to have an initial sort of allergic reaction to your deal. I think, right? I think, I think that, that, that um, from an investor's perspective, that more sophisticated investor, that, where that, that expectation is there, I think that's, that's probably right. And then we get asked all the time, so how do I even set a valuation, whether it's a cap or whether it's, it's, it's a priced round? And again, it's, it's just backing into the return the investor wants, right? So I think a lot of companies, the range is helpful, but the range is really driven from the fact that, hey, I'm a seed stage investor. I want 10 times my money. I'm going to do the math. <laughs> I'm going to believe that if I put $5 million into you at a $5 million pre at a $10 million post, We'll keep the example simple here. No further money. Well, I got to believe you're going to get out $100 million or I'm not getting my 10x. Right. Right? So you think a lot of companies don't put the thought into saying, well, here's the exit that justifies the valuation. So the reason we put a $5 million cap on the note and the reason we're, we're going to raise five to get to a $10 million post is because we, we can defend the fact that we can get to a $100 million exit and you're going to get 10 times your money. Right. Right. That's the analysis that I think uh, sometimes startups don't go through to sort of figure out what... At least the investor's perspective, how they're viewing it, and yeah. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, so, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to get this name wrong, but Sushmita Ch Chatterjee, who's the CEO of a company called LearnRoll, if a startup is very early stage, do you recommend an LOI or letter of intent with the co-founders? Is that a good strategy? Can you elaborate a little more on the resources mentioned to can help formalize this relationship in a cost-effective way? So it sounds like almost pre-company type of... I think that's... Yeah, so... Like, hey, we're, so we I, need I, to I, get an understanding here. Right at that stage, it, I, so I think it is... Uh, I mean, if you if you can do it, right? I mean, usually companies at that early stage, there's so many unknowns, it, it could be difficult to actually come up with a dynamic <laughs> or at least a, a framework. But you know, that said, I, I, I would absolutely encourage people if, if they are willing to go through the exercise and, and put down on paper some kind of understanding around ownership and expectation and, and so on and so forth. I think it's, it's a good thing to do. I don't think you need anything more than Microsoft Word and a couple of hours, right? Uh, to, 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 to do that, uh, there are any number, I'm sure, resources on, online and on Cooligo. We've got lots of, of articles that help people on, you know, think about pre-formation types of issues. But at, at that early stage, because of the just the reality that there are so many unknowns, I think you're probably going to be dealing with a very short list of things that you'd want to you'd want to address, right? Um, but it, it is it is it is important even from when you think about you know, idea, intellectual property, capturing that, right? At the point at which that clearly becomes something that, that is uh, of potential value, right? It, it is important to, to form an entity, to make sure that, that entity is, 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 is the owner of that intellectual property because the last thing you want is you know, two founders to be working together and not having a clear understanding of who owns what and if there's a split before there's actually uh, an entity formed, then whoever came up with the idea or right. contributed is the owner by default. Yeah, no, I, we've actually had a, a company that fell into that, like they were about to form the company and then they had the falling out. Right, and now all of a sudden you've got a, a, you know, a, a, a former or potential founder, right? Or well, they ended <laughs> up not that, the, the founder who was still really excited about the opportunity, and we were too. Um, just walked away, just said, I can't, you know, I'm going to go do something else for a year. Right. Because um, this situation is just, it's too difficult right. um, to manage, which really was unfortunate. So it's, I think um, it's safe to say that, it's, yes, it's encouraged if you, if, you, if you can do that, to, have, to, have, to start those conversations. I think it's important, but it, it, it seems to me that once you start to have those conversations, the rest of this probably comes together pretty quickly, in which case you might as well be 
just as well off forming an entity, which frankly is not that expensive to do, and a lot of free resources to help with that. Uh, Cooley Go, and uh, you, you know, frankly, any number of places online where you can download corporate forms, and there are all a number of, of legal yeah, service providers. Yeah, and I think the other, the other place to get some that. help is just find a mentor or an advisor, That's an right. exited entrepreneur, someone who's willing to give you a little bit of their time, who can kind of provide independent, objective. Right. guidance and oversight to say, okay, you know, based on my experience, this is what feels like a fair equity split right. based on, you know, based on what I've, you know, what, what, what you've told me about your roles, etc. Right. Um, and there are a number of websites, I think, out there that will do matchmaking with startups, you know, to, Absolutely. to advisors. Absolutely. Um, but I think that, that, that's a really important point. I think that the, the, the sooner you find a mentor or an advisor in, in the industry or that you trust, I think you're, you're better off, right? To just have that kind of wisdom experience to help, help you think through some of these things because they're not intuitive necessarily, right? And, yeah, I and, mean, those folks are invaluable, you know, just... If and the reality is people like to help people. And that's right. If you, it, you know, sometimes you it's just as it's right. just as easy as asking. Right. If you want help, ask for money. If you want money, ask for help. Right. Right. I mean, that's certainly true. And I think one of the advantages we have at Dreamit is we've actually built out. If you go to the Dreamit website, you'll see we have a list of really awesome advisors. Yeah, great mentors. Uh, great mentors who are really just passionate about startups, more than happy to jump on a call, or if they're local, more than happy to get face to face with companies. Um, so yeah, we're we sort of consider that one of our value adds in addition to our own internal expertise is having this large network uh, of, stakeholder network yep. uh, of mentors and advisors. Um, so we're at 110. Dush, Dustin, who you can't see behind the camera there, who is our awesome videographer and director, uh, says we have time for one, one more question. Ah, I think this is a good one. So uh, Dave from a health tech startup, uh, wants to know how much equity should you give to board members and advisors? <laughs> so so uh, the, the, lawyer, the lawyerly answer is it depends, you know, that said, and, and it, when I say it depends, it, it depends on, on what, the, what the advisor, what the consultant is, is actually going to be doing, right? You know, that said, there, there are any number of, I think, benchmarks that are, that are out there that are easily uh, available, ascertainable, that, that will give you ranges uh, of, of sort of expected allocations to your, your to whether it's a scientific advisory board or some other kind of advisory board, whether they are directors, whether they are uh, executive chairman type of, yep. of roles. There, there are ranges that, that I think the market is comfortable with, right? And so, you know, without kind of giving you specific numbers, I, I mean, I can give you specific numbers if you want them, but. I, I would say that that it, it largely depends, and this goes to expectation and having conversations about what you're what you're actually expecting to get out of your advisors, right? Is this a scientific advisory board that you're anticipating giving you one to two hours a month and two days a year, or is this someone that you're going to be on the phone with several times a week at eleven o'clock at night looking for guidance on thorny issues, right? So definitely different expectations there in terms of what compensation should be uh, 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 an investor director versus an independent director versus right. someone who's operating in an executive chairman role. Different expectation, different ranges uh, in terms of equity compensation. But there, there are a lot of good metrics that are available on, online. I mean, numbers we typically see, and, and feel free to chime in if you've seen different ranges, yes, it always depends, and these numbers are very negotiable, right? Because That's if right. you're if you're trying to recruit a rock star CEO, sometimes you just got to pay to, and you'll be at the higher end of the range, which I've seen, you know, can be three or four percent when you've got that person who's going to be super valuable. But to your point, they're also committed to putting a lot of time and effort. I'm going to work one, two days a week on your company. We've had an executive chairman on right. one of the companies I'm involved with. He got four percent, but he committed yeah, to that, a that's a lot know, of work to up to two days a week, right? On the other hand, if it's an advisor who's just going to chime in a couple hours a month, you know, that might be a quarter, half percent. Right. Right. But I'm a huge fan of modeling this stuff out and actually putting math behind it and looking at the advisor and saying, look, here's, let's, let's put a value on your time. We've agreed that you're going to give us an hour a week, four hours a month, and here's what your time's worth. Right. So we can then translate that 
into an equity based on where the company is today. And by the way, if we roll this out and do some math, here's what that equity would be, be worth at a successful exit. I really think being, even with employees, anybody, being transparent on what the potential value of that equity is and say, hey Jeff, you know what? You're gonna work with us for the next three or four years. You're gonna give us that hour a week, four hours a month. But at the end, when it's all said and done, we do the math, that's worth $150,000. Right. If we all get to where we think we're going to get, right? Right. That seems like a pretty fair compensation for the effort we're asking you. No, to and I think it's a fair point. I mean, the same way that when you're out asking for money, you need to be able to defend it and have a budget behind it and 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 and, and map it out. And in the same way, and this is particularly the case with equity and equity incentive, and you think about what a pool would look like, is to have some sense of of, of what that's going to get you, right? And and have 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 that plan, at least roughly put together, right? Because as you know, right, the, the advisory board that you have in year one and two may not be the advisory board you need in year three and four, right? And so right, exactly. you're constantly going to be having to, to, to rethink these things. And so that equity needs to vest in the same manner That's we right. describe that was the next point. For, exactly. for employees because, right, that executive <laughs> chairman might be great for your first two years, but you need somebody different. Right. Um, there. Okay, I guess that's all the time that we've got. Uh, first, I want to thank you so much for doing this, yeah. Jeff. I thought it's fun. Spot on insights, really, really valuable um, guidance for uh, for all of our startups out there. Uh, thank everyone so much for joining us. So I just want to um, summarize with a, a few closing uh, thoughts here. One, uh, if you enjoyed today's discussion, please go to dreamit.com slash live. You'll be able to access previous shows uh, as well as make topic suggestions for for future shows. Uh, please like and subscribe to our YouTube page. There's lots of additional content there, including Dream It Doses, uh, which are great content-driven pieces to help. They're all less than five minutes, help you avoid some other mistakes that we didn't e even have time to, to talk about today and, and offer some other pearls of wisdom. Uh, applications for the uh, Dream It Spring 2020 program were now open. So uh, please go to our website to apply. Uh, you'll also be able to access videos on the website that will provide a true insider's view and look at our program from the perspective of the participant companies. And finally, I'd like to invite everyone to, to join us for our next Dream It Live show. That'll be uh, on November 15th at 2 o'clock. Um, my colleague Andrew Ackerman, who is the managing director for our Urban Tech Vertical, uh, will discuss the data revolution uh, in real estate with Cherry founder uh, uh, Salmonson. So thank you everyone uh, for participating today. Thank you again for doing this and hopefully we'll see you at the next Dream It Live.